Corey, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the game at T-Town. Hey, man. Glad to be back. How y'all doing? Man, we're great. Uh, just trying to make sure that we don't overreact or underreact on these first two games here in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, I understand. It's, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a good thing going so far. Hopefully, we can continue to build on it. Yeah, and I want to maybe get your takeaway. First off, uh, as a linebacker, when you're watching a game on the defensive side of the football, what what are you glued in on? I mean, can you get your eyes off the backers, or, or are you trying to follow the ball, or or maybe what? How do you watch a game and evaluate when you're watching? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a little bit difficult when you're watching a broadcast. I mean, if you're live, uh, you're there, you're seeing it in person. Um, it's a little bit different. You definitely are kind of watching uh, the defense and seeing what they're doing pre snap and trying to figure out what exactly kind of coverage they're be, they're going to be in or what the trying to see what any kind of kind of tips that you can get, but. Honestly, um, if it's at home and the broadcast is is on, it's kind of just watching it for pleasure. You know, there's it's definitely you, you you when you watch big plays happen, you, you glue in more to the replays, and uh, you can easily pick off what what went wrong, who didn't set the edge. I, that's probably the most uh, since that was the majority of my role uh, when I was there playing playing outside backer and inside backer. Is you can always tell certain plays when they bounce to the outside for big yardage you kind of just look to see who didn't set the edge who had contained what whose responsibility was what so uh it's it's a you can't get away from the fact that you are so used to breaking down film for a long time that it just doesn't just leave you you definitely have those tendencies to to be watching and seeing who's going to make a mistake especially at the position that you know the best which is uh which is a backer position we're talking to Corey Reamer, a national champ winning linebacker here at the University of Alabama. Corey, let me go to the, the backers just for a couple of minutes. Evaluate those guys. What do you see? What, what do you see these guys are doing? Good things and maybe some things you'd like to see them take a step uh, in another direction and maybe improve. Yeah, they've been uh, they've played well so far off the, uh, straight out of the gate. I mean, it's been uh, they've had some good tests. We've had a lot of uh, some explosive offenses that we've had to face so far. So, you're seeing a lot more from our secondary than you probably are from our backers, but it's been uh, I've been pleased to see uh, see how these guys have kind of stepped up and and roasted the challenge. Uh, but like I said, you you see some mistakes here and there, and that's exactly what I was talking about. Uh, I feel like whenever we have given up some uh, some big plays, there's been a few times in pass coverage where we haven't passed off guys like we're supposed to, or or match patterns that are uh, that are pretty standard patterns. That I think that just comes with you know some more reps, but then. What probably frustrates Coach Saban and those defensive coaches the most is when we let when we let plays bounce or we don't set set the edge or, or or have contain and those guys the offenses that we're playing are breaking contain and going off for you know big yards just converting long uh, long third downs um, so I think that you know we're going to definitely have to improve it this weekend uh, against a very another explosive offense for the third week in a row. Yeah, but see the problem is is you guys set the sort of bar here. Uh, with this standard, <laughs> and, and and what we so we yeah. blame it on you guys. I mean, because what we it's do our, is it's our fault. It's yeah, our fault. yeah. Because yeah. I mean, we we like. I mean, listen, we're we're all you know griping and complaining here in Tuscaloosa because they had a fifty-seven to seven win. I mean, why did we let them score seven points? Why? Yeah, did, look, why did that is, happen? Uh, that's the that is the monster that Coach Saban has created. I mean, he expects uh, he expects perfection. And I know he hates to hear, you know, when people and the fans are complaining, but we are a direct reflection of his expectations. And uh, that is what you're going to get with this fan base is that we always know that we can do better. He's preaching that we can always be better. So the fans naturally expect us to be better. Uh, you know, we don't like to see um, any weaknesses or any chinks in the armor. We want to be perfect every week, which is a, is a high goal. It's a high bar to set. But, I mean, that's the reason why we're in the seat we're in today. So, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's a product of the of the environment that Coach Saban has definitely created for sure. All right, it's, we, it's 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 a realistic goal. We've got a lot of talent down there, so I mean, there's got to be some high expectations. Well, and and certainly rightfully so. Let me ask you. I, I know it's a different position, but the way that you understand the defensive, and and we always like to say, I think Ozzie Newsom uh, told me this: when you play here in Tuscaloosa, you get a PhD in football. He said that's, that's right. Uh, yeah. I, I'm curious what you see in these young defensive backs because they've even exceeded my expectations uh, in that back end, that third level guys. Well, you know, you, you, uh, when you're recruiting the way they recruit, these guys are obviously naturally gifted athletes. Uh, the, the hardest part that we always saw 
when Coach Saban showed up is that we had a lot of guys with talent that couldn't pick up the playbook. And Coach Saban is always a big advocate. If you don't know what you're doing, and I, if I can't trust that you know what you're doing and the other guys on the field can't trust you, then we can't play you. So what he's done a great job is, is uh, really creating a culture that these guys understand what's expected of them as far as knowing the playbook. And, and then the more you know it, the less you've got to think when you go out there. And so you've got to give kudos to the coaching staff for getting these guys ready to go, especially such a young group replacing six guys. You see a lot of young talent that's being developed out there, and there are mistakes that are made, and that's naturally going to happen. I mean, it, there's going to be new things that we see on a week-to-week basis uh, that you know film might not show when you're preparing for a team. So there's going to be mistakes. I think if – uh, you know, the communication seems to be extremely, you know, vital. It's a very big part of what, of you know, a secondary having success. And I think that the communication has been pretty good so far from what I can tell. It just, I think them getting used to uh, where it's second nature of, of watching uh, plays unfold, formations unfold for the, for the pattern match to really go as smooth as Coach Saban wants it to go. It's just going to take more reps, and I continue. I think that it's only going to improve as as the weeks go on. What do you see in Tosh Lapoy? Do you see anything different from your perspective as we make that transition from Jeremy Pruitt to Tosh Lapoy? No, I think we're uh, I think we're getting a good combination of him and Coach Smart. I think uh, everybody kind of knew that Coach Smart didn't cause many pressures as Coach Pruitt did, and I think what we're seeing right now is uh, is a good combination of that. I think we're getting uh, pressure when we need to, and we're able to uh, drop back and, and let the quarterback make the mistakes, and uh, and we're going to be the beneficiary of it. I know that this weekend uh, we're facing a pretty good quarterback at Ole Miss that has had a, a lot of success early on. I think he's thrown for like 800-something yards, a couple TDs, no interceptions, and they've got an offensive line that, uh, that's, that's protecting him extremely well. So I think uh, – it's going to be interesting to see now that we've really got a test of uh, really going to have to get after an offense that puts up a lot of points for us to really uh, leave Oxford, you know, victorious. Is we're going to have to get after this guy a little bit, and it doesn't seem like he's had a lot of guys in his face up to this point. So I'm I'm going to be very eager to see the kind of pressures and how he kind of how he plays this offense that uh, is very explosive this weekend. When you're breaking down film, and and for those of us who have never played at the level that you've played here at the University of Alabama, when you're watching an offensive line, are are you watching literally every move they make and you're trying to pick up with maybe they're giving you a little bit of a tip, uh, maybe they're leaning a little bit more heavy on a a hand and uh, maybe leaning a little bit back if it's a pass player. Are you looking for things that are that minor or more of maybe the the way they're set up and the way they're kind of twisting some of those blocking assignments around? Oh, yeah, you, you definitely know uh, there's definitely dead giveaways. When you've got a guy who is, who's nervous about getting beat off the edge, you can kind of tell he's trying to cheat. He doesn't want to get beat just as bad as, uh, you know, he's, he's trying to make sure that he puts himself in the best position to succeed. And, you know, you can always kind of tell a guy, well, the way a guy rocks, the way um, maybe a guard sets a little bit off the line of scrimmage a little bit more than he normally does. If he's blocking straight ahead, you can tell he might be a pulling guard. Uh, but then, of course, you've got – they're looking at film too, and so they're trying to get creative, and they're trying to find ways to throw us off, try to give us telltale signs that um, they we might have studied up, up, and they know that – they know it's been a giveaway in weeks pr- uh, prior, and now they're going to try to play mind games with us too. So it – you know, there are definitely some guys who who were who gave away a lot more details than others, but we're we're definitely paying attention to a lot of uh, a lot of stuff as far as formation goes, and there's and and the way that these guys set up of what we're going to be getting. Corey, take us inside of a Thursday practice that's happening right now on the campus of the University of Alabama. I've often been told Thursdays can be the most difficult of the week. Yeah, Thursdays are. Uh, this is really the mental practice this is when you're really getting after it making sure that you understand what you're going to be getting after you've had the physical days on monday and tuesday and you've implemented game plan um you know tuesday and wednesday and now it's time to really button up uh some of the stuff that we haven't seen a lot of on film and this is this is one of those where they're going to throw everything at you on thursday really try to test you mentally see how you respond, and then they can really tell what they need to go back to the drawing board and work on and get ready for for the game. So, you know, it's it's not a full pad practice, uh, but they're definitely sitting there um, when they're getting ready for practice and putting together the play sheet. 
they're they're not putting together the easy ones that they know we're going to get correct. They're trying to see how well we've been paying attention and how well we can adapt um, for things that maybe we haven't seen. So as much of a it's not more as much of a physical uh, difficult physically difficult practice as much as it is a mentally difficult practice. Let's go into the RPOs just for a couple of minutes. And Nick Saban even explaining yesterday, he, he threw out the phrase that you will see as many RPOs as possibly that can be run mm-hmm. in a three-and-a-half-hour game from a team like uh, Ole Miss when we line up on Saturday evening. When you look at these RPOs, we've talked about it multiple times with you and other defensive players. At times, maybe they're a little bit unfair because they fire off the football and it's kind of hard to read those uh, when you're looking at you know the, the line of scrimmage. Uh, from your level, but just talk about the difficulties, the challenge uh, of playing a team that runs so many RPOs from so many different looks. Oh, it's impossible. I mean, I don't understand. I don't know what the argument is. I don't know if there's there's really not a way that you can stop it. I mean, you think about it. There's not a – there's no way that you can call this. So whether it's fair or unfair, the way – it's a judgment call from a guy who's on the – you know, a line judge who's sitting there trying to decide if the guy's three yards, three and a half, four yards, five yards. I mean, it's – there's no way that anybody can really call this. So, I mean, it's a, it's a clear advantage to an offense. And so, for there, – there's no way – and there's – it's impossible to defend because if you're coming up to play the run and he, can, he still has the ability to, to stop and throw the ball over your head, you, they're going to have success doing it. There's, it's you just got to have eleven guys that are doing their job, and you're really relying on your front seven to rally to the football when they're running these RPOs. Because a DB, a DB that has to come down from the top and play contain or is responsible for a contain, uh, it's going to be difficult to call those types of defenses when you've got this uh, RPO option because a guy can't come up and play the football uh, if he's still got to worry about the ball being thrown over his head so this is really when you've got to have the front seven rallying all the time just running completely nonstop to the football because it's it's an impossible it's impossible to defend I don't know how it's still legal I don't know how the rules are going to change but uh you know it's it's something that you you better we better get ready for because you're going to see more and more of it because it's it is so difficult to defend. I'd love to see it go to the NFL rule of one yard. I think it'd be much easier for the officials. Oh, because... I do too. I completely agree. I don't I I don't understand how um, how any way anybody can justify the fact that there's an offensive lineman that's five yards downfield uh, and we're all keying off of that you know on the defensive side of the ball. How is that legal that he could be five yards downfield? And a ball still be thrown. I mean, it's there. It, I completely agree that it should be changed to a one yard rule, and that's and that's it, and that's the way it should be. All right, so let's go to the offensive side of the football from a defensive guy. The way that Tua Tagovailoa is spreading the football around, I think it's thirty five different uh, receptions. I think it's nine different receivers have caught footballs. I mean, he's spreading the love and getting a lot of these different skill position guys involved in the offense. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the stats that I've read is the amount of targets that he's um, been at, gotten after these first two games. It's been unbelievable. The guy just has, you know, you just, one of those things that you just can't coach. I mean, the guy's got the, uh, uh, an amazing ability to see the field and not only see the field, but feel the pocket and feel. He's not having to look down and see what's going on in his feet. He can see the field so well. It gives him the best chance to be able to get these different targets. He's making his reads. And going through his progressions extremely well, uh, the guy's just a natural talent. Um, it makes it it makes it extremely difficult. You know, when you're trying to uh, isolate certain guys, and he, on the from a defensive perspective, from a game plan perspective, you're trying to isolate, make him throw to certain people. This guy, you're not gonna you're gonna have a really hard time isolating anybody and making them go certain ways. This guy will make his reads all the way through his progressions and then come back through because he's, he's always got his eyes downfield. And that's just a good sign of a natural quarterback who's been doing this for a long time and doing it at a high level. How would you defend him? I mean, you, you're creating a game plan. What would you Ooh. do to attack this guy? Um, I don't want to tell Ole Miss anything that, uh, you know, go, don't give me away any secrets here. I, you know, this is – this is one of those guys that you've got to keep him on the move. But you, the the main thing is is uh, when you get a chance to bring him down, you got to bring him down. This guy has an ability to get away from uh, from pressure, and if he has you know, if you can't bring him down on the first go, you're really going to be in trouble. Um, it's you've got people got to wrap up and get after this guy and, 
and uh, and hope you can get some pressure from without having to bring the house. Uh, if you try to play man to man with a quarterback like this and bring a lot of pressure, it's going to be uh, really difficult on your DBs to keep up for four quarters. At some point, he's going to be able to break you uh, and and figure out how to beat this defense. So. Um, you know, that would be, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to throw different looks at him, things that he hasn't seen a lot of and try to confuse him as much as you possibly can, uh, to where it gets him off of his natural rhythm. If you can, if you can have a game plan where, uh, it, it's just a change up from what they, what they've been watching from, uh, a film perspective, I think that's the best way to handle guys like this. And the same thing for Jordan Tiamu is, is We've got to we've got to bring pressure and also give him looks that he's not comfortable seeing. Don't you expect if Alabama because let's not I won't let you say this, but statistically speaking, Ole Miss is not a very good defensive team. I don't want to give them any bulletin board material, but if a team struggles in, in stopping the rush, stopping the pass, don't you expect to keep that explosive offense for Ole Miss on the sidelines? That Nick Saban's going to come up with a game plan to kind of give them a big old dose of rushing. Uh, the football right down their throat until they find a way to stop it. Yeah, but I, mean, I think you, um, I think you go back and you watch. You know, the two, the two opponents that they've played so far, I wouldn't say are the top notch defenses by any means. They're definitely not um, defenses that you would put in a lot of the conversations in the in the top half of college football right now. But you definitely did see a lot of adjustments that they made last week. After halftime, after giving up so many points in the first half, they came out and really stymied. Uh, Southern Illinois offense and um, and so they're they're a little bit more I don't want to take away from the talent level that they have on the defensive side of the ball you know they've they, I don't think they came out as ready to play as they probably should have last week um, but I think uh, it's it's easy to sit here and say if they're going to try to score 75 points let's try to take the ball out of their hands that's an easy game plan but with an explosive offense like that you know it doesn't take them long to score so We've got to be able to keep up with them as well. Uh, our defense is going to get tested this week. We've had two good weeks of, of offenses that like to throw some wrinkles and that they've caused us to make some busts in the back end. I think it's given us two weeks of good film to go watch and try to try to clean up a lot of mistakes that we made. I know Ole Miss is watching the Louisville tape and seeing um, you know our younger DBs and the mistakes that they made and, and what patterns caused us the most problems. So, I, I guarantee that Coach Saban's in there making sure that we are very clear on our roles on when we get these types of looks. And so we'll be prepared. Hopefully, uh, you know, this is the third week. We've gotten these guys. They've gotten their feet wet. They're no longer freshmen, you know, and sophomores. They're, they've got two games under their belt. It's time to step up and make sure that uh, that we're, we're communicating in the back end and understanding how uh, routes unfold and, and making sure that we, you know, create the least amount of mistakes uh, from a pattern matching standpoint as we possibly can. Any uh, Ole Miss trips that stick out to you in your opinion of playing there? Oh, see, Ole Miss was my favorite place to play. Uh, I think I, out of the you know three years that I played, um, I, I always had my best game uh, at Ole Miss. It was a fun place to play. I don't know what the reasoning was, but our senior year in 09, I had a block kick. Um, I had a cost fumble, recovered fumble, um, and a lot of uh, – I had a couple couple sacks and a lot of tackles. Uh, it's just a fun place to play. But I do remember my my sophomore year going over there, and uh, it was a tight game. And these guys are passionate about their football. It might not be the biggest stadium, but they get after it. They're, uh, they don't like it if things aren't going their way. I remember having to wear our helmets going into the – halftime uh in 2007 I think it was uh when we were up at halftime and there was a couple calls that the Ole Miss fans thought that they should have gone their way and uh they were peppering us with with a whiskey flask and beer bottles and all kinds of stuff as we were running into the locker room for halftime so uh it's a it can be a hostile environment it's uh it's not going to be as loud as what you get from other stadiums but uh it's a fun place to play and I always had good games I loved going over there because I knew it was going to be a good day Corey Reamer, outside backer at the University of Alabama, national champ, and he owns a jewelry store there in Hoover with all those championships here in Tuscaloosa and all those won in high school. Do you display those rings? Do you, like, have a coffee table there and all those Absolutely. championships? Absolutely. Unfortunately, you know, I only got one. You know, all these guys that are rocking around with – No, you know, no, I'm talking got... about Hoover. I mean, you, you, you collected three oh, the there. Oh, I mean, I mean, you, you, you got three, three there. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. SEC one title here, Alabama. Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you got yeah, enough yeah. – 
to hey, run we a, put it on display. It's something to be proud of. I mean, this is a great time to be a, an Alabama fan. And Hoover's continued on with their dynasty as well. Those guys are continuing to win championships. But, uh, you know, winning three there and coming and having a chance to win a national championship in Tuscaloosa is I'll take it. It's uh, they're they're always on display for everybody to see. Hey, no doubt. I watched the Bucks last week, uh, and that really the, the the beating of Thompson. It was a great game. Oh, man, so they they're doing good things over there. They could coach uh, Nibble. has got that team fired up, and uh, they continue on. They're uh, continuing the legacy. Hey, no doubt, Corey. Thank you again for jumping in and talking some Alabama football with us. We appreciate the conversation. Great breakdown as always. Thank you, sir. Hey, absolutely, guys. Roll time.